Welcome. Welcome back to part two of the solar system uh, lecture for Earth science class. Uh, in the first section, first part of the solar system, we talked a little bit about uh, Earth's place uh, in the solar system and beyond the solar system. And we found that, uh, generally speaking, the Earth is uh, quite small uh, when you compare it to uh, stars beyond the solar system and even the planets themselves in, in our solar system. Then we uh, took a trip through a timeline of about, uh, oh, about 1800 years. And we looked at the evolution uh, of the knowledge to, you know, why we think, why we believe our solar system looks the way it does today. And so we looked at uh, Ptolemy and the geocentric model then Copernicus, the heliocentric model, and then Tycho Bray, which pointed out um, that uh, we have background stars that are several, several, several light years away from our solar system. And then uh, we looked at Johannes Kepler, in which he had the uh, three, um, um, three laws of planetary motion. And then we looked at Galileo being discovering the mic or discovering the telescope and being able to look at planets as three-dimensional uh, um, three um, surfaces. And then finally, we uh, looked at uh, Isaac Newton, which kind of brought everything together and showed why uh, Newton or why uh, Johannes Kepler's three laws of motion work because of gravity. So that was part one. So part two of the solar system, we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit. And we're going to talk about reasons for the Earth's seasons. And the question that's often asked is, why does the Earth even have seasons? And so we experience uh, uh, a winter period, you know, and then a, uh, a fall period and a spring period and a summer period. And so why does the Earth have seasons? And when this question is asked, the most common wrong answer is the Earth gets close to the sun and far from the sun during the one year revolution. So if it's close to the sun, uh, we have um, um, summertime. And if it's far from the sun, we have uh, wintertime. In fact, this question uh, was asked several years ago. I was watching a television program uh, right around graduation time for all the colleges across the United States. So it was about May or June. And uh, they were at the Harvard University, and they had these Harvard graduates all lined up. And the, uh, um, the reporter went down and asked each one of the Harvard graduates, they're all dressed up in their cap and gowns, and asked each one what causes the seasons. And the Harvard graduates actually said, as the Earth gets close, we have summertime. As it gets far away, we have wintertime. And again, the most common, common uh, wrong answers. In fact, when the Earth is away from the sun, this farthest point, we're actually experiencing summertime here in the Northern Hemisphere. So my point is that I vowed as your Bakersfield College instructor that I was going to talk about the seasons. And I want to make sure that uh, Bakersfield College graduates uh, understand the real reason for the seasons. And really, it boils down to this for the seasons. And that is that the Earth orbits around the sun and the sunlight or insulation is directed above and below the equator during the year because the Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees. And so that really is the bottom line answer is the tilting of the Earth. So the next several slides we're going to go through and we're going to look at the geometry of that 23 and a half degree tilt and how that uh, expresses the seasons uh, in each one of the hemispheres of the Earth. So this is just a little picture that's showing you the Earth tilted at 23 and a half degrees. I thought it was a cute picture in terms of its animation. This shows you now the heliocentric model. And of course, the sun is in the center of the solar system. And what you can see is you'll see the Earth uh, moving around the sun uh, very quickly, uh, uh, demonstrating a one-year uh, period, but you can see that the Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, and that axis stays stationary 
as the Earth makes its way around the sun. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put the Earth in four different positions as it goes around the sun. And we're going to look at where the sunlight or the insulation is directly uh, um, shining, if you will, on the Earth's surface. So in this first slide then, basically uh, it's similar to the previous slide, but this time we stopped the Earth in the four positions. And so you see the sun in the center, and let's go ahead and start with June 21st. And on June 21st, if you look at the directions of where the sun rays are focused, uh, the sun rays are directly focused on the northern hemisphere. Because of the 23 and a half degree tilt, the Earth is angled uh, towards the sun. And so on June 21st in the northern hemisphere, this is referred to as the summer solstice, which is also referred to as the longest day of the year. And the question is, is it really the longest day? I mean, 24 hours is 24 hours. And so what's really being referred to as the longest days is on June 21st, we experienced the longest lengths of sunlight. And so it's about 18 hours of sunlight and six hours of um, evening time. Now, if we allow the Earth then to go from June, July, August, September, and we look at the direction of sunlight um, on the Earth in September, you'll notice that the sunlight rays are directly on the equator. And again, because of the Earth's tilt towards the sun, um, the, the rays have now dropped down to the equator. And so this is known on September 21st as the autumn equinox. The term equinox means that the sunlight is distributed equally on both hemispheres. So we're looking at about 12 hours of sunlight in the northern hemisphere, 12 hours of sunlight in the southern hemisphere. So let's go now from September, October, November, and December. And if you look at where the Earth or the sun rays are concentrated in December, in this case, they're concentrated in the southern hemisphere, which now creates a winter solstice for the northern hemisphere where we live. And this, in this case, we have 18 hours of sunlight in the southern hemisphere, six hours of sunlight in the northern hemisphere. So really what's happening then is that the days get longer and shorter in terms of sunlight. And so here being April, um, now the sunlight uh, is now becoming longer and longer until June 21st. Then after June 21st, daylight becomes shorter and shorter and shorter. And then finally we reach December 21st. And then the Northern Hemisphere, uh, that represents the shortest day of the year. And now we go from December and we go to January, February, and we go to March. And on March, uh, the sun rays now return back to the equator. And so really what I try to do here is make the sunlight in front of the earth right here. And so now it's pointing at the equator. This becomes the vernal or spring equinox uh, in March 21st. And so again, as the earth is rotated, um, you see the angle, the 23 degree, 23 and a half degree angle uh, dictating the position of where the sunlight um, hits the earth. Now, what I would encourage you to do, I think this is kind of neat, is that uh, we are so used to living in the Northern Hemisphere that, for example, during Christmas time, where my arrow is, it is uh, our winter time, and we're used to seeing uh, Santa Claus and, and Christmas holiday dec decorations all formatted for winter. I would encourage you uh, to look up on your smartphones Christmas advertisements for Australia or New Zealand, for example, because in the Southern Hemisphere, they celebrate Christmas as summertime. And at some point in your looking at advertisements, uh, you may see a picture of Santa Claus in Speedos on the beach. That would be interesting. Today, uh, if you look at the bottom of the screen, we're in April. So again, we are now approaching June 21st and the days should be getting longer. And when we reach June 21st in about a month and a half, um, we'll be at the longest day of the year. 
So the next question to ask is when is the sun directly over your head? And this is an important question because this is known as the noon time sun angle. And when we say noon time sun angle, we're talking about the fact that the sun is exactly 90 degrees or perpendicular above your head. So if you were standing up, you would look straight up and point your hand straight up and uh, the sun would be at 90 degrees. So when does that occur? And in fact, what if a person wanted to experience summer all year long? Would that be possible? And the answer is yes, if you were able to follow the noontime sun angle across the globe over the, over the year's period. So let's identify some geographical areas on the Earth, which are very important. And the area um, that's north of the equator, uh, and this would be 23 and a half degrees north of the equator. This is known as the Tropic of Cancer. Then of course we have the equator located at zero degrees latitude. And then south of the equator, we have uh, the Tropic of Capricorn. And so the Tropic of Capricorn is 25, 23 and a half degrees south of the equator. Now, why are these latitudes special? In fact, why was 23 and a half degrees north and south of the equator chosen? And that's because as the Earth rotates and moves around the sun, the uh, insulation, the direct insulation, uh, continually moves between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn uh, over, over the period's time. And so if we were to follow the sun, and if we were to um, always have the noon time sun angle directly over our head, uh, following the sun may look something like this. So if we start on June 21st, and we start on the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, we would want to be standing right on the Tropic of Cancer. And to my knowledge, uh, there's a little city in uh, Mexico, Mazalan, and Mazalan um, is, uh, sits right on the uh, latitude of 23 and a half degrees north. So at 12 noon in Mazalan on June 21st, you should be able to stand there and witness and experience the sun directly over your head um, at 90 degrees. If you wanted to continue to follow the sun at, at uh, the, the uh, noontime sun angle, then we would follow the sun then to the south and we would jump in a boat, get on the water, and we would follow the sun for the next three months all the way down to the equator. And then once reaching the equator uh, would be there September 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, we'd be at the vernal, uh, or I'm sorry, the autumn equinox. Then if we wanted to continue to uh, uh, endure the noon time sun angle at 90 degrees, we would continue to follow the sun more south and we would end up on the Tropic of Capricorn on December 21st. And again, the noontime sun angle would be directly over our heads. Then we'd want to head north. And as we head north, uh, we would uh, come in contact again with the equator. And then this time it would be March 21st. Um, and then we would head north again and we would complete the year cycle back to June 21st uh, on the Tropic of Cancer. And so looking at this path of the sun, because of the tilt of the earth, the sun will follow this path in between uh, the two tropics. And one could always experience uh, the noon uh, time sun angle. Uh, only recommendation, bring lots and lots of sunscreen. So the question then that takes place is why in Bakersfield, for example, on June 21st at 12 noon, we walk outside and you look at the sun's angle in the horizon and yet it's not 90 degrees above your head. In fact, in Bakersfield on June 21st, the noon time sun angle is not 90 degrees. And why would that be? The answer to that is we are not on the Tropic of Cancer. Uh, but instead, we are about 45 degrees uh, latitude, so we're above the 23 and a half degrees. So therefore, the highest point at which the sun is going to be in the horizon in Bakersfield, California on June 21st is just right around 78 degrees in the horizon. So if the horizon um, is, 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 uh, meets the Earth's surface, 
you go up from the sur Earth's surface at about 78 degrees on June 21st, and that will be the highest position of the sun. So if you want to experience that highest position, once again, uh, go outside on June 21st at 12 noon, and the sun will be in its highest position. So during the year, the sun will uh, change its position in the horizon as it rotates around the sun. So for example, on June 21st, on June 21st, um, um, as the sun, as the earth makes its way around um, the sun on June 21st, and then it goes into July, August, September, October, November, December, and all the next six months between June and December, the sun will be lowering itself in the horizon until we get to December 21st at 12 noon, and that would be the lowest position, which I believe is about 28 degrees above the horizon in Bakersfield, California. Then, of course, after uh, December 21st, um, and it goes from January, February, March, April, and May, uh, then the sun, of course, makes its way up. So today we are in April, and so if I put my, um, whoops, there we go. And so if I circle April um, right here, then uh, the sun is on its way up to the highest uh, point in, um, in the horizon. Okay, so that was just a little overview of why uh, the seasons uh, take place, mainly because of the tilt of the earth um, being at 23 and a half degrees. Um, your job is to make sure that you can actually map out or draw a picture of the earth, make sure that you can uh, locate the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn, and understand the geometry. Because on the exam, you will be asked questions, uh, for example, um, when, uh, what date, for example, would springtime be in the Southern Hemisphere? And so remember, anything in the Northern Hemisphere is opposite in the Southern Hemisphere. So springtime in the Southern Hemisphere would certainly fall in uh, August or September. The next section I would like to look at is an overview um, of the planet. And so here we have 1,500 years of astronomical contributions uh, that we've uh, that scientists have discovered, and uh, plenty of photos of the planets. And so I want to go through each one of the planets. I'm going to go through pretty fast. And really, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some common planetary uh, characteristics. And what your job is is to know the common differences between the inner and the outer planets. So as we kind of go through these planets, uh, start looking for um, the different uh, types of uh, differences. So we're gonna start with the first planet from the sun. We'll start with Mercury. Uh, Mercury has a diameter of about 3000 miles across. It's a small planet. Uh, the axial tilt is zero. And so when we say axial tilt, that's like the axial tilt for earth is 23 and a half. In this case, Mercury, um, is zero degrees. Kind of think about and contemplate how seasons would be on Mercury with an axial tilt of zero degrees. Uh, one um, uh, day, one Earth day is 100, I'm sorry, uh, one day is 167 Earth days. So that means that Mercury goes around pretty slow. It rotates slow. Orbital period around the sun is uh, 88 days. Mercury has no moons. Surface temperature of Mercury is 332 degrees centigrade. Very, very warm. You would expect that next to the sun. Atmosphere, it doesn't have one. Again, close to the sun. The sun's solar winds probably act as a huge blow dryer and just probably blows the atmosphere right off. Named after the ancient uh, god of messengers, and Mercury is 36 million miles from the sun. Let's look at Venus. Uh, Venus is a close relative to Earth with respect to size, about 7,500 miles across. Axial tilt, 177 degrees. Uh, one day is 116 Earth days. Orbital period is 225 days. So you notice as we get farther from the sun, it takes longer to get around the sun. 
no moons. Atmosphere is a thick atmosphere of carbon dioxide. And surface temperatures are about 867 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you can certainly think, think of the greenhouse effect uh, with that thick carbon dioxide for high surface temperatures. Named after the Roman god of love, uh, all features are named after women. Uh, Maxwell uh, Mont is a mountain range, uh, which is uh, always coined as the only man on Venus that can be good or that can be bad. However, one wants to look at that. And it's 67 million miles from the sun. The next planet, of course, will be Earth. And Earth is 12,000 miles across. I noticed on the slide it says Earth. Um, the software cut the H off. So we know it's Earth. Uh, axial tilt, 23 and a half degrees. One day is one day. Orbital period, 365 days. One moon. Surface temperature, 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. Named after Gia, Greek. Uh, named for all living things. Um, Earth is 93 million miles from the sun. Then the last uh, terrestrial planet would be Mars. And Mars is quite a bit smaller than Earth, about uh, 4,221 miles across. Axial tilt, 25.2 degrees which is pretty close to the axial tilt of Earth, which astronomers can actually watch Mars make its way around the sun and notice the ice caps uh, waxing and waning, uh, just as you would expect for Earth. Um, and so they can see the seasonal changes on Mars. One day is 24.6 hours. So Earth is spinning, or Mars is spinning a little faster than, uh, than Earth. Orbital period, 687 days. Noah's is starting to take longer to get around the sun. Two moons. Surface temp is minus 85 degrees, but it also has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide. But in this case, the carbon dioxide is very thin, and certainly Mars is farther from the sun, giving rise to the colder temperatures. Named after the Roman gods of war, the red planet. And Mars is 141 million miles from the sun. So we've just looked at the terrestrial planets. And we learned with the terrestrial planets that we have heavier atmospheres. Uh, we learned with terrestrial planets that they uh, rotate and move around um, uh, in terms of their day uh, very slow. Um, and they um, move around the sun. Um, a little bit faster than, than the gaseous planets that we're going to look at next, uh, but that's just directly related to the distance from the sun. So now let's look at the um, um, gaseous planets and we'll look for some commonalities there. So Jupiter, uh, huge, 88,000 miles across, uh, axial tilt 3.13 degrees, length of day 10 hours. So what's that tell you about um, the uh, how fast Jupiter is spinning. Is it spinning fast compared to Earth or slow? Well, if it only takes 10 hours, it's whipping around pretty fast. Orbital period, it takes 11, almost 12 years to get around the sun once. 63 moons. Surface temp is 166 degrees minus. Uh, atmosphere is hydrogen and helium, named after the Roman god of lightning. And Jupiter is 483 million miles from the sun. So in this situation, right off the bat, we notice that the atmospheres are much lighter on the gaseous planets with hydrogen and helium. They're much bigger and they spin around faster. Next is Saturn. Um, Saturn is, um, is uh, 74,000 miles, basically in diameter. Axial tilt, 26.7 degrees. Length of day, 10.6 hours. So again, it conforms to the gaseous plants in terms of spinning pretty fast. Orbital period, 29 and a half years around the sun, 47 moons, minus 140 degrees Fahrenheit surface temperature, atmosphere, hydrogen, helium. Again, very gaseous, very light gases, very cold, named after the Roman Lord of the Rings. 887 million miles from the sun. Finally, we have Uranus. Uh, Uranus is 31,763 miles across. 
Axial tilt, 97.7 degrees. This planet is unique with respect to its axial tilt because this is known as the rolling pin uh, planet, meaning that as it rotates around the sun or orbits around the sun, it rotates in a rolling pin fashion. The axial tilt is almost 90 degrees. One day is 17 hours. Again, planet spins fast. 83 years to get around the sun once, 27 moons, surface temperatures minus 319 degrees Fahrenheit, and there's uh, hydrogen um, there, and of course CH4 is methane, named after the god of heavens, and Ur uh, Uranus is uh, about 1,784 million miles uh, from the sun. So this gives you kind of an overview of the planet's and some of their characteristics. And I would encourage you as you prepare for the exam uh, to go through and again, pick out the dominant um, commonalities uh, between the gaseous planets and between the uh, terrestrial planets.